Good morning. Well, you're in for a real letdown today. <laughs> After listening to the doctrines of grace for the last two months and listening to Jason, he's not going to be there. Might be here, but we'll see what uh, we'll see what the Lord says to us today as we uh, go through the lesson. I'm going to read. Uh, we're back in Mark where we left off, so we're going to be in Mark six. Verses 30 through 44. So I'll read that and then we'll pray and then we'll consider uh, God's word. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people and he divided the two fish among them all and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish and those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men can we pray heavenly father lord we just uh we celebrate that we have another day that we can just come before you and lord just bow before you and honor you and lord just uh open up your word and Lord, just uh, let it pour upon our, our minds and our souls, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just uh, lift your word up to you that, Lord, as we consider and as we read and as we think about, Lord, just the uh, implications in our own lives and, and what you're trying to tell us, that, Lord, you just teach us. Lord, we thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. All righty. So... Fun fact, I'll start with a fun fact. Uh, interesting, and even significantly, of all the miracles that occurred in Jesus' ministry, there's only two that are recorded in all four Gospels. Anybody want to guess the first one? The resurrection. That's a given, the resurrection. That's a miracle. Most of us think of you know, healing the blind or something like that. The resurrection... And the feeding of 5,000. I didn't know that. You know, I never thought about it. But if you go through, and I listed there on, uh, on your sheet the, the four accounts, if you want to go through and read. And quite interestingly, and, and pretty much how we ought to do everything, and this is one of the things I love about uh, this church and Jason and how he teaches, is that as he preaches and teaches, he doesn't just give one account. He goes through all the accounts to bring all the pieces together because each of the Gospels, each of the disciples that wrote the Gospels, they all had a little bit something different to add. Some were quite blunt and just kind of direct. Uh, some gave a lot of detail. Uh, some brought in other details. So a couple of, in a couple of the instances as we go, go through this, we are, we're going to go back and forth kind of between some of those accounts just so that we have a good understanding of, for example, 5,000 men. You know, it says 5,000 men. Does that mean there were no women and children there? Does that mean, well, they just, they just used the word men? No, we'll, we'll go through some things like that. Anyway, uh, this miracle occurred near the end of Jesus' Galilean ministry. According to John 6, 4, it took place shortly before the Passover. Probably in March, maybe early, early April, 
in the year A.D. 29. So Jesus was raised in Galilee. We all know that. He was from Nazareth. But that probably was not the reason for his extensive ministry there. You know, we, we sometimes think, well, he was from Galilee, so that's why he stayed in Galilee. Christ probably stayed in Galilee because of he could focus his attention far away from the Israelites' religious establishment. So we know what the Israelites and what the religious establishment thought of him and wanted to do to him. The Lord could use this geography uh, to make a spiritual point with his own disciples and his people. He was trying to teach them. So uh, you just kind of look, well, we'll go on. Other than con, uh, from confronting and condemning the Messiah had nothing to do with the nation's apostate leadership. So, you know, he stayed away from the scribes and Pharisees. They usually came to him, and then that's when they would start ridiculing. So if you just kind of look at some of that opposition, uh, you look at Mark 3, 6. The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. That's pretty hostile, don't you think? Uh, Mark 3, 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. Uh, we actually talked about that the last time I taught. That was when... Uh, Jesus' family came to try to rescue him when he was in the house with all the people and, and uh, the kid fell out, I think it was the one where the kid fell out of the window. Uh, and then Luke 9, 9, Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is, who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Do you want to see him to become a, a, a Christian or to sit under his leadership and teaching? No. He wanted to kill him. Uh, you know, he was, uh, Herod was, he was intrigued by John, but you, you know the story, he ended up beheading John. So, uh, Jesus had this growing opposition uh, as well as, from the leaders as well as the king, and his f focus became more and more on training his disciples and less time teaching in public. Uh, his focus was training the twelve for the mission he would give them after his resurrection. So what was that mission after his resurrection? When they're all in a room and he comes back. It's the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So that's what he's, he's, he's resurrected. That's his, that's his primary goal with his disciples. So now as we get into the lesson, that's just a little bit of background. Uh, now as we get into the lesson, look at verses 30 through 32. So the disciples returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to eat. So, uh, let's go ahead and read 32. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So, what had the disciples been doing? So, if we, we, if we back up a little bit and we look at Mark 6, 7 through 13, it tells us... Uh, Jesus had just sent the disciples out, kind of like Noah, two by two. And he had given them pretty, pretty direct instructions. Uh, he gave them authority over unclean spirits, and he charged them not to take anything with them. And what, what did he say to do if someone rejected him? Shake the dust from your sandals and go somewhere else. So he, they had just been out, and if you look at uh, verse 13, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So they had been busy. They had been out by themselves. Jesus had sent them out two by two. So on the way back uh, to Jesus, there was another significant event. So at that point uh, in verse 29 of Mark 6, they also hear about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been beheaded. So in verse 29, 
When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So that kind of gives us a little bit of background of why Jesus said, let's, let's go to a desolate place and let's rest a while. Kind of get your, get your thoughts back together. I can teach you and we'll just kind of, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, relax and teach. So uh, they had been teaching and preaching and healing and casting out demons. Then they had gone and, and, and buried John the Baptist. Uh, but his, that mission also included much persecution and rejection. So if you go back to uh, Matthew 10, verses 16 through 23, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. So he sent them out two by two, and this is kind of what he's telling them. You, you, you think you'd be a little bit scared? Do you think that they're going to go out two by two, and as they do it, well, hey, I really didn't have much persecution. If Jesus is telling them you're going to be persecuted and they're going to treat you like sheep around wolves, you could pretty much expect that. So we know that they were persecuted and rejected. So when Jesus hears of all their journeys, and now John the Baptist's death, he knew they needed that rest. So he told them to go get in the boat. We know that several of the disciples were fishermen by trade uh, before they were called. So they probably had a boat there. Uh, and their ministry had been so intense and nonstop, they couldn't even find time to eat. We talked about that also the last time I taught uh, back in Mark 3 uh, when his family went. And, and it was just, they, there was always a crowd. And why was that crowd always around? They weren't there to hear the preaching, right? They wanted to see the show. So the sick people were there and the people that wanted to see the show. So he was healing the sick, which they needed. But they were, the others were there just to watch, hey, that's pretty cool. It's like going to a magic show to them. So in verses 33 and 34, uh, he goes on to say, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So the people recognized the disciples in Jesus. They, they knew these miracles that he could work. So the sick and those people who wanted to see the show followed them down to the water when they got in the boat. They ran, ran along the shore watching to see where they were going. So they, uh, they ran along the shore watching. And so John 6, 2 it just kind of backs up uh, why they did that. And that is a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Okay, the signs that he was doing was not, you know, when it's talking about they saw those signs, it wasn't that they that they wanted to be part of what Jesus was trying to teach about the kingdom of God. They wanted the healing and they wanted to see it. So uh, once again, John's kind of giving us a little bit more detail there. So when Jesus and his disciples got, it, got to their destination, the crowd's already there. The crowd has already grown. And uh, so they get off the boat. What's Christ's uh, thought when he gets off the boat? What are you guys doing here? No, 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 no. Our Lord uh, had this significant compassion. He could have ignored them. He could have sent them away. He could have said, go somewhere else and go in a, in a direction that they can't see us. But no, he welcomed them because he felt compassion for them. And I, I have a Greek word written there. I, I really felt this was... This gave us a good example of Christ. I felt compassion. And the Greek word is, Jason, you want to say that? That's what he said? Which means, literally, to be moved in one's bowels. So that's a little bit beyond he felt sorry for them, right? 
I mean, he was moved internally because it's a sheep and they had no shepherd. So he was literally moved from the bowels. Uh, he, they were wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. So this is society. Guess what their primary agricultural duty is? Sheep. If you remember when they went, when the Israelites went to Egypt, they put them way out somewhere else because sheep herders were the lowest of the low. That's what Israelites did. That's what the chosen people's primary background was, was sheep herders. So that was a mainstay of life. They would have recognized when Jesus is saying they're like a sheep without a shepherd, all the dangers that they could have encountered. You know, whether that's lost, whether that's wolves, they would just be wandering around with, with no direction. So that's the kind of compassion that, that Jesus had uh, on the people that were there. So he goes on and, and uh, it talks about in, in 33 and 34, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, going into 35, and when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. So it's probably somewhere between 3 in the afternoon and 6. So it's about to be sunset, um, and, they're, and they're considered considering the people are going to be tired. They ran here. They're going to be hungry. What are we going to do? But something that, and, and this is kind of one of those things, once again, you just kind of have to read all the scripture to understand, but it says they were in a desolate place. What do we typically think of when we say, when we think a desolate place? I think of like desert. This was not a desert. It was in the springtime. It's green. It's right next to a lake. It's beautiful. What desolate is referring to here is it's out by itself. There's nothing around it. So as you read on in the scriptures, what does he tell them to do? He tells them to sit down in the grass. So it's not a desert, okay? It's, it's a hillside. So the disciples, uh, they're trying to figure out, so what do we do? So they go to Jesus and say, send them away. It, 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 this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to get the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So looking at verse 37, what was Jesus' response? You give them something to eat. He doesn't say, okay, let's figure out what's, what to do. He says, you give them something to eat. So Jesus knows what he's going to do. We know of Jesus' sovereignty. He knows what he's going to do. He's just going to show them what he can do, right? So you give them something to eat. And of course, as the disciples always did, they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? So 200 denarii was 200 days of wages. That's a lot of money. So do you think they had these money bags that they're dragging with them? in the boat, and then up the, up, up the hillside? No. So the disciples are saying, we don't have any money. How are we supposed to go buy that much food? You got 5,000 men? Somewhere between probably seven and 10,000 people? Where are we going to get that? So looking at uh, verse 38, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And that go and see is a verse that Many times we skip over. So he tells them to go amongst the people because he wants them to recognize how little food was there because he knows what he's fixing to do. So they come back and John records, John 6, 8, and 9, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Andrew's the one that says, here's what we got, Lord. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. 
but what are they for so many? Okay, so the 12 disciples and Jesus are standing there. Andrew reports back, here's what we got. No way we can do anything with five loaves and two fish. But there is something that they can do. And sometimes people think, okay, five loaves, you know, they're these big hunks of bread. The word for loaves is actually like a cake or a waffle, like a little bread waffle. And it's a little boy, okay? He's not going to have five hunking loaves of bread. Not that five loaves of bread is going to go anywhere of 5,000, but it's not like he had a lot to do with. So uh, the disciples are, are, still, are still shocked because there's no markets, there's no food, there's no money to feed the people. But they got five loaves, and they got two fish, and so uh, I want to call them biscuits. They got five biscuits and two fish, and I want to read uh, something that Spurgeon said. I found this interesting, and I didn't want to just try to type it all out, but uh, this is what Spurgeon was saying about this. He, it was who thought of the way of feeding them. It was a design invented and originated by himself. His followers had looked at their little store of bread and fish and given up the task as hopeless. But Jesus, altogether embarrassed and in no perplexity, had already considered how, how he would banquet the thousands and make the fainting sing for joy. The Lord of hosts needed no entreaty to become the host of hosts of hungry men. I mean, Spurgeon never says anything delicately, but he says it pretty accurately. He knew what he was going to do. And why was he going to do it? He wanted the people to see who he was. He wanted his disciples to see who he was. So he takes the five loaves and two fish, and what does he do? He looks up, he looks up towards heaven and breaks the bed. And he blessed the food. How many times do we sit down? I mean, if you're raised in church, you probably, as a kid, your parents may have prayed before you have a meal or asked you to pray, and you say, God is great, God is good, let us thank you for this food. Amen. You know. And it was all cute, and it was, it was cool. But this is what it's about. It's about thanking God for our bounty, for what we are going to partake, because God provides. So next time you're eating and you have, have your blessing, think about it that way. So he then he broke the bread, and what was he doing as he broke the bread? He's giving it to the disciples to distribute. So they would go take a basket. He had them sit down in 50s and 100s on the hillside. This was not something that was unique or unusual to those people. That was typically what they would do. They would be organized in groups of 50 or 100, almost in rows or columns, whenever they are being taught. So it wasn't something that was unusual for them to be seated, you know, in 50s or 100s. But it, it was more of a, a way of being organized for that distribution. So it wasn't like they were walking down, people were sitting, and they set a basket on the row, and you just took what you wanted as it went by. This way, the disciples and the people could see everything that was going on. So he's passing, passing out these baskets, and the disciples, I'm thinking of how tired they must have gotten, just walking back and forth going and distributing this food. So, uh, so he breaks it and he distributes. Have you ever wondered why there's no mention here or in any of the accounts, any of the four accounts, why no one attempted to s explain why the disciples or the apostles that wrote these four accounts, why they didn't say anything about how it happened or any details about it happening is because they can't. It's a miracle. They just came back and <laughs> there's another basket of food. 
You can't explain it. Just like you can't explain the miracles. Except that it's God's sovereign power that's doing it. Okay? You know, a lot of people want to try to, on the blind, you know, oh, well, there was something in the mud that made him be able to see. No. Something in his spit that made him see. No. It's a miracle. So that's why there's no account of that. So all ate and were satisfied. And I, I found this interesting. Satisfied is translated from a Greek word, tortazia. Is that it? Is that close? It's close. Okay. Or tortauza. Maybe that's closer. Uh, but tortauza, the Greek word, is from the animal husbandry background, which once again, they were sheep herders. They, they knew this. But it's meaning uh, a life, livestock is eating until it can't eat anymore. Okay, so I immediately thought of a cow or a horse, something big. They eat all the time. They just eat and eat and eat and eat. That's all they do. They ate till they were full. So they were completely full. It wasn't like they just, you know, sometimes Leanne and I will eat and, you know, she, she eats part of it and she says, I'm at a good spot. They didn't just eat and say, I'm at a good spot. They ate till they were full. So they ate a lot is what I'm trying to say. So they were completely full, satisfied to the point of wanting no more. So, I think there's a loose association here. MacArthur has kind of associated this, but I think there's a loose association. Uh, in Matthew 5, 6, there's actually a bat beatitude about the hungry. What did he say? The hungry shall be fed. Right? Were they fed? Yep. So Jesus then instructs uh, the disciples to do something else. He tells them, go get the leftovers. Pick them up in these little baskets that you've been, been distributing with. And I remember in vacation Bible school when I was a kid, and this was, seems like it was every year we talked about feeding the 5,000, but the teacher or the instructors would always bring you know, these big wicker baskets like you get at Michael's or Hobby Lobby probably wasn't those big old whisker baskets. It was probably be more of a little basket that they would kind of carry maybe as a lunch box or just to carry something in. I think probably the little boy's basket was one that carried five biscuits and two fish. So it's not these big, I'm assuming, doesn't say that, but I'm assuming that, that it's not these big honker baskets. But the significance of that so they got 12 baskets left over. What's the significance? The significance is, how many disciples were there? There were 12. They each had their own basket of food. And they sat down, they ate, and shared with Christ. So Jesus provided for everyone there, including himself. So... Mark concludes with how many 5,000 men, concludes with there's 5,000 men who ate the loaves. If you look at Matthew's account, 1421, uh, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So that there tells us it's more than 5,000. So a lot of people try to go to, well, you know, men were the only ones that were counted, so... It really was only 5,000 people, but uh, that's not true. Astonished by the scope of what they had just seen uh, and probably the de deliciousness of what they ate, uh, John 6, 6, 14 records the people's response. It's really not here, but in John 6, 14, it's the next to the last thing on the second page. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. So the prophet was probably a reference to Old Testament because you know the Israelites and, and those people, all they had was the Old Testament. And the prophet was basically uh, the projected Messiah. So they think, they're thinking, surely this guy is a prophet or the prophet from the Old Testament. 
So uh, they were right to identify Jesus as the Messiah, but they still misunderstood the full purpose of his coming. And that full purpose, he came to seek and save the lost and give his life for ransom for many. And you can look at six, six, John 6.35, uh, where he's talking about he is the bread of life. Uh, whoever comes to me shall not hungry, hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So kind of uh, an interesting story. I encourage you all to uh, read uh, the four different accounts because each account gives you a little bit different uh, viewpoint and synopsis of the entire miracle because when you just read a part of it, you may not pick it all up. So anyway, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for, Lord, just uh, allowing us to be part and, and be able to partake in your word and, Lord, just read your word and, and Lord, we thank you for uh, our brothers and sisters here, Lord, and how we can love each other and how we can rely on each other for better understanding of a truth. We thank you for Jason and uh, Lord, just uh, the thoughts and the words that you put into his mouth. Heavenly Father, I lift up the rest of the service and Lord, I just uh, lift up the partaking of the Lord's Supper uh, at the end of the service, Lord, that Lord, you just uh, touch each, each of us in ways that we didn't even know you could touch us. Thank you for loving us. In your name we pray. Amen.